Uh, before we start, could you just explain to the room what your organization does? Okay, I'm the CEO of WNS Global, and we are a global tech and ops company with 60,000 employees across the globe. We operate from 65 development centers, 13 countries, and our core differentiator is we are experts in business domains. We bring technology, we bring analytics, and we help companies transform their business outcomes through our tech and ops model. How's the rollout of AI going in your business? What sort of stuff are your clients asking you for? And how are your staff reacting to the rollout of AI? So, Will, first and foremost, AI is here to stay, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a technology, it's a movement that we're very excited about because, you know, for us, Delivering great outcomes for our clients is really our, our business mantra. So any technology that we can introduce that has the ability to be a force multiplier, to actually deliver you know, much higher impact, that can do things faster, better, and cheaper, right, is something that we would always implement. So if you look across the years, as a business model, we've been through three different models, and each time it is tech and great people that have transformed us. If you look at our business 20 years ago, I would call our business your mess for less, which is processes from the West that were brought into our domains and delivered in a cheaper fashion. Then over a period of time, as we learned the process and we brought great people and technology in, we created a model which was value beyond cost, which is, you know, we now we're transforming it with the help of technology, with the help of analytics and things like that. And over the last few years, it is business, it is digital transformation, where we have brought in things like uh, you know, robotics process, you know, automation, uh, as well as machine learning and things like that. And what is really interesting now is the age of AI and ultimately, you know, uh, generative AI as well. So all of these are now being embedded in our solutions. We are training our people in terms of how to work with all of these models. And therefore, as a result of it, we're, you know, we're using all of this to build great outcomes for our clients, which will help them be smarter in front of their end customers. We were talking about the element of building trust. How are your staff reacting to this? Are they concerned about their futures? Look, anytime there's a new technology that is introduced, the first thing that everyone focuses on is, um, you know, is it, is it something that is going to take out jobs or is it something that is ultimately going to enhance somebody's job? And across the years, whether it is a political event or whether it is an enhancement in technology, one has always seen that anything new first results in a load of skepticism. Thereafter, you know, as people you know, uh, work with these technologies or work with some of these uh, new movements, it becomes par for the course. And then over a period of time, it becomes part of your DNA and that's how you live your life. So for us as well, you know, when, uh, when the industry first saw AI as a new technology coming in, there was a lot of skepticism. Is this going to take our, uh, our jobs out? But I think as we have learned as a, you know, as a company, as businesses, working with governments, to essentially navigate the opportunity and not the threat, I think people are getting far more comfortable that this ultimately is really going to be a force multiplier. It is going to be another tool that they will use in order to deliver better outcomes for clients, for people, for humankind, for society, if you ask me. And that's exactly how our people are you know, actually uh, accepting this model. One of the things that I often find when I'm on uh, the BBC or talking sort of to a mainstream audience, they're still super concerned about jobs being lost. One of the things you were talking about was actually raising the standard of learning and quality of the people you have working for you. And you're very much seeing that already starting, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely, Will. So if you think of it, I mean, just go back a few years, you know, when the first computer came, was announced, that immediately created the impact of, you know, maybe I'm going to be impacted negatively. Then when internet came in, 
that's the same thing that happened. And we saw, we've seen this across the ages, whether it's the steam engine, whether it was, you know, electricity, whatever you've seen, you, we've always met these new changes with skepticism. But I think what has now happened is people are now realizing that technology is here, technology is a given, technology is the way out of, you know, uh, of uh, uh, the, you know, the current situation we are in. And whether we like it or not, technology is something that is going to, you know, be a force multiplier, like I said in the past. So for us, uh, if you look at AI as, as, the, you know, as the, 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 the core here, one has to learn to trust AI if we want to succeed, right? So if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at what we have done with our employees, the first thing that we have done is trained a number of them in terms of some of these models. Uh, at our company, for example, close to about 18,000 people are trained just in AI and Gen AI uh, kind of models. Everyone has got the comfort around the fact that these are models that are here to stay, that they can actually help you know, dramatically change uh, things for the better. And the use cases that we are focused on are essentially, again, to enhance the quality of outcomes you know, for, for our clients. Now, just take the example of uh, you know, how business, technology, companies, governments can come together and build this AI and trust. Just a simple case, as opposed to you know focusing on you know essentially the uh, the the threat and not the opportunity. Just look at the NHS. If, as opposed to you know uh, looking at the, the threat part, if we say that let's work with the algorithms that are possible, let's work with you know AI and repurpose our processes and systems in such a manner that people who need treatment are fast forwarded to the front of a line, can you imagine what it would do in terms of, say, cancer treatment? We all know, for example, that you know, someone who is you know, identified with stage one cancer, quite often within five to six months is already at stage four. But if you go with the, the, the current waiting period, it's quite possible that someone who does not need a scan is actually getting priority because they're in front of you on that list. But with the help of AI and some of these algorithms, if you could identify who are the people who need this treatment faster, you could actually give that person a much better chance of survival and move them you know, uh, very quickly into treatment as a result of which the prognosis outcome is potentially far better. So that's really how we're looking at it. And from a business point of view, what we are focused on is not the potential disruption our business is going to see, but really, how are we going to use this technology and all these new changes essentially to get after the white spaces that are available for our business? I actually think that hardly 25% of our business in the sector is actually penetrated, and there's a 75% white space, right? We believe that with this new technology and with this new thinking, it is going to allow customers and prospects to want to open up that other 75% because they don't want to invest in it. They want people like us and companies like us to really invest behind all of these technologies to open it up. That's uh, where I'm actually at at the moment is how, what are your clients thinking about in terms of AI? Are they coming to you for guidance and advice or are they coming to you and saying, have you got a product or a solution that will, will fit this? Where, where do you think the stage is at for the businesses that you work with? So, Will, everyone is now looking at this as, you know, what I call robotics process automation of the past, but on steroids, right? Everybody has learned from the past. Everybody has learned from the mistakes of the past as well. And so, one of the things that clients are, and prospects are telling us is, we don't want to invest in the licenses behind this. We understand that people like you know our business domains well. We know that you're investing in really smart people behind the scenes. Remember, I said 60,000 people, 16 or 14 countries, and 65 centers. They're also saying that you are investing in analytics, uh, business analytics that can help us, therefore, provide a, a, a great outcome as far as the data that we have. Therefore, we want you to do all of it, and we just want to climb on the bandwagon of success. So if you look at it, we are not, at this point in time running close to about 90 proofs of concept across areas and across companies that are essentially proving the case with a number of companies. And 
what we think is that over a period of time, this will accelerate at a pace that has never been seen, right? It will result in much higher productivity. It will result in our people moving from lower end jobs to much higher, you know, uh, kind of jobs. It will mean more and more people being trained, upskilled and reskilled to newer areas. And ultimately, I think it'll result in a much better world for all of us. And that's the responsibility of people like yourself, isn't it? Leaders of businesses not to look at these AI tools as a way of just reducing costs. There is a way. One of the things that first struck me when I spoke to you, we talked about the fact you had 60,000 employees. The first thing you said to me was, yes, but I've got 200,000 plus mouths to feed. Something like this, the sort of the ethical considerations of this, they must be constant in your mind, right? Absolutely. Well, I think it's important. I think most CEOs are looking at these kind of situations in this fashion, because if you just look at, uh, you, you know, if you look at things in a very narrow sense, then it's quite possible that you'll be focused only on the PL side of the business as opposed to the social side of business. But the reality is, like I said, you know, I have 60,000 employees, but I think every day when I go to the office that my job is to make sure that I have, you know, enough opportunity to feed 240,000 family members of those people, right? And when I look at it in that format, I'm going to leverage technology and all the goodness of technology to create new opportunities and therefore expand my business as opposed to looking at it, you know, shrinking. So I will all the time look at, you know, tools like AI and technology like, like AI um, as a collaborator and never a threat. Where, where, where are you at with, in terms of businesses and governments collaborating on this? Do you think we're going to find this, this market heavily legislated? Well, the reality is, you know, the future, as we know, is already here. It's just unevenly distributed at this point in time, right? And somebody said that before me, and I, 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 I agree with that a lot. Uh, I, I think what's going to happen is, uh, in the short term, there's going to be a lot of hype and a lot of noise about the potential for job losses, right? Uh, though in the medium to the long term, I actually think that this is actually going to be creating more jobs, it's going to be creating more opportunity, just as we saw across you know, different movements, whether it was during the Y2K time, during the Asian crisis, during uh, Brexit, during COVID, during the time when RPA was released, during the time machine learning came in, every time we were told that this new change means lesser jobs and more job losses, but each time it turned out to be a tailwind and not a headwind, right? At this point in time, what's actually happening is at least two or three of the governments where a large population resides will want to get involved in legislation. Look at India, look at China, close to 30 to 40 percent of humankind is sitting there. And a lot of these people are engaged in low level, you know, kind of work and they will need some amount of protection. So I, I, I actually see some of these countries already focusing on creating some kind of friendly le legislation as a result of which you know, jobs for those people are protected. But in the longer term, I actually think all of this will result in you know, more jobs being created and the market actually becoming much bigger. We were talking about India earlier. How, and just talk a little bit about how you think your market, that market will prepare and, and thrive for AI. And you were talking about the possibility of businesses looking to create um, you know, uh, large language models in, in local dialects, weren't you? So just talk to us a bit about what might be going on in India. Look, India at this point in time have close to five to six million people out of the 1.4 billion people associated with this business or the technology business directly, right? Uh, therefore, the potential for that country over a period of time through its reskilling and upskilling exercises and bringing more and more higher skilled people into the talent force will mean that it can ultimately continue to be a, a talent provider to the globe in this whole area, you know, the whole area of AI, uh, generative AI, and ultimately maybe even AGI, we don't know, right? But I think India is focusing right now on the blocking and tackling, getting more and more skilling programs in place, getting more and more, you know, uh, upskilling programs in place, taking it into the hinterland of each of the states, each of the villages, uh, making sure state governments and the central government see this as a serious, you know, agenda point for the long term, that's one. Second thing is taking all of this into the core uh, areas where India needs development, healthcare, you know, farming, retail, so many other things where 
each of these technologies have the ability to transform livelihoods of people on a daily basis. You know, so we're taking this into you know, uh, the, the hinterland of the country, you know, so to speak. And if you look at it, AI is already being used in a number of very interesting use cases. I gave an example of, you know, recently there was a, uh, a train accident, uh, maybe a few months ago, and uh, they had, uh, you know, 200 bodies on that train, and it's an accident, so you know you you, you can't recognize uh, the, the people because people people's faces are damaged and things like that. But they used AI technology, you know, uh, as well as uh, you know uh, uh, you know other available you know technology, including the, the use of algorithms to link up with cell phones, understand who were on this train, many of whom were ticketless travelers, right, and then link it with their biometrics and then understand therefore who of those people who potentially were on the strain were not actually connected back to their families. And that's how they found that close to almost 95% of those people were identified to be on the train, lost their jobs, and the bodies were returned to the families within one day. Now, this is a, uh, a use case yeah. of leveraging technology for the better good, if you ask me. But there are many such cases, you know, of, of this kind, which uh, India is now implementing. And you need to do that in a country of that scale. And you're talking about upskilling in India. It doesn't seem to necessarily be the case in many Western countries yet, does it? That that same approach to kind of like really bringing the whole workforce with you. Do you, do you see other companies in other countries adapting as quickly as Indian companies are? So I would say that you know, close to 70% of companies in India are implementing you know, AI models, right? And that's a very, very healthy kind of a, a penetration level, I would say. I, I'm also seeing, if you look at the, you know, the three top countries in terms of investment in, in just Gen AI tools, uh, it's the US, China, the UK, India is also you know, very much there in the top 10. But it's very clear that every country is investing in it. Some of these technologies need huge amounts of capital, and quite often it is not possible for the government to do it, right? So very often you will see that it's the private sector and the businesses implementing you know, some of these investments, like you're seeing in the US and China, as well as you know, partially in the UK. But I would say that you know, uh, every country has now understood that AI is really not a disturbance but it is an opportunity. Everyone understands that this is going to be a tailwind. It is here. It is now. You can't ignore it. You cannot avoid it. And therefore, you will see uh, com countries that have not caught up, you know, voting dramatically with more and more investments in this area and catching up with other countries as well. Just coming to the end of the conversation, the, the younger generation, here in the UK at the moment, we seem to almost be banning chat GPT and it's being demonized in sort of the academic purpose and sense of schools. What's your view with young people and getting young people involved in Will, tech? Well, when you went to school, when I went to school, when we were young, we were taught grammar, we were taught mathematics, we were taught English, we were taught other languages, right? And we didn't have a choice, we had to do it. Similarly, I would say that Technology is the future, whether we like it or not. This is something that is going to, you know, penetrate each and every one of our lives and therefore allowing youngsters very early in their lives to experience technology, to experience new models like AI is, is going to be important. And I just want to give you an example. Uh, so I actually think that, you know, a curriculum should have AI, generative AI in, in schools. I think companies and schools should make it compulsory for kids to learn about you know uh, about you know some you know a kind of a language whether it's chat gpt whatever because whether you like it or not you're going to be working with it in the long term there's no point ignoring it and i i just want to mention that a few years ago uh when i was looking at making an an investment in what i call the world's first companion robot company this one uh it's called miko people laughed at me saying that why in a country with 1.2 billion people would anyone need a companion robot you know what People do need it. People love this technology. Uh, the company is doing extremely well. But more importantly, not only is this technology working with young children, but over a period of time, the applicability of this is to take it into healthcare, to work with dementia patient, to work with Alzheimer's patient. And that's the impact of technology. Technology can take you to places that you have never been before. So don't fight it. Accept it. Keep moving ahead. 
Thank you very much for your time, everybody. You can find him on LinkedIn and X, uh, regularly posts on there, and you can find me at Will Guyer on X. So thanks for listening. Thank you very much.